with us. We thank God for this privilege and opportunity as we continue our study tonight in the book of James, the book of James. We're going to, we just finished the fourth chapter of James, my brothers and sisters, where we talked about wars. James asked us where the wars and fightings come from, and he told us that they come from within us. Amen. We talked about the enemies that we needed to uh, not only face, but we need to conquer. So tonight, my brothers and sisters, we're going to look at uh, St. James chapter 5, the epistle of James, chapter 5, the last book of James. I'll be using the King, New King James uh, version of the Bible tonight. And as we look at this uh, chapter, we need to realize that James is actually seem to be dealing, uh, calling our attention to how we need to be living. James seems to be encouraging the Christian to live his life for Christ in light of Christ's return. James want us to know that in light of the Lord's return, that we need to be living our lives today for Christ. Don't be waiting until you get to heaven to live for Christ. Christians need to be living for the Lord today. Not only that, but seems to me that James is telling us that believers are different from the world, and it's up to us, my brothers and sisters, to let the world know that we are in Christ, and that because we're in Christ, that we are different. We even need to realize that there are times when we, as children of God, for the sake of Christ, have to give up our rights, but not our responsibilities. Anybody going to be with me tonight? Yes, my brothers and sisters, I have a responsibility to the Lord. I may have to give up my rights, but not my responsibility. I have a responsibility to live for the Lord, for he is my Savior and my Redeemer. So James chapter 5, we're going to call it the last days. James is dealing with calling our attention to the last days. There's a way that Christians need to be living in light of what? The last days. While there are several uh, things, or let's call them several miscellaneous matters in this last chapter of James seem like the key thought uh, seems to be that of the second coming of Christ. If we look at verses 7 through 9, as we will deal with tonight, if it's the Lord's will. You see, my brothers and sisters, when a Christian honestly look for the return of Christ, you will see the evidence in his daily life. Are y'all with me tonight? The believer in the, uh, Christ, the Christian, the child of the king, James teaches us as we're going to look at, first of all, at verses 1 through 11, and we're going to split, have to split them up a little bit, but we're going to look at verses 1 through 11, James 5, 1 through 11. Uh, but the first thing what, that we are dealing with here is that the believer is patient even when we are wrong. James is teaching us that the believer, the Christian, the child of the king, even when we are wronged and mistreated, we still must have patience. We need to have patience in order to wait up on the Lord. Amen? We don't need to be in the business of paying back. We need to let, <clears throat> allow the Lord to do the paying. All right? So my brothers and sisters, as we go into this study tonight, keep in mind that in those days when James was writing this letter, that there was a great guff between the rich <clears throat> and the poor. We need to realize that the middle class, as we know it today, 
was not a major factor in that society in that day. Matter of fact, it was all, really, <clears throat> from what we can tell from the scriptures, you were either very rich or very poor. There really was not a Miller class. You had the rich and the poor. So it seemed that the gospel appealed to the poor. Are y'all with me? To the poor people, where the rich rejected Christ in so many cases. Now, we know in all cases there are exceptions. And then we see uh, uh, that the poor was being oppressed by what? By the rich. And so this brings us down to our lesson tonight. They re the rich rejected Christ. The poor seemed to accept Christ. But the rich, we're going to see, was oppressing the poor, doing things uh, according to their own way. So let us, as we begin tonight, look at verses 1 through 6. As we begin our study, and we'll break them down a little bit that we might kind of look at them, these verses, and see what James is saying to the church, not only for that day, but for this day. Are y'all with me? There is much injustice in the world, but what we got to make sure as Christians that we're not a part of that injustice. And remember, James is writing to the believers in Christ, the Jewish believers around Jerusalem and that has been scattered abroad. Wherever those believers are, James are writing to them, teaching them how to live in light of Christ's return. My brothers and sisters, this will help us as Christians live for the Lord if we live it in light of his return. We must believe that the Lord can come at any day because he's told us in his word that he's coming back. So let's look at these scriptures here in chap James chapter 5. Now, as I read these, verse <clears throat> these verses, I want you to think about something. In, in verses 1 through 6, we're going to see the sins of the rich. James deal with the, some of the sins of the rich in verses 1 through 6. So James lists several sins and show that the rich are only preparing themselves for coming judgment. Let's look at James chapter 5. We're going to read verses 1 through 3. Come now, you rich, <clears throat> weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasures in the last days. Did you see that, my brothers and my sisters? What James is dealing with here. So James lists several sins and shows that the rich are only preparing themselves for coming judgment. Are y'all with me? Christ is coming back. Christ is the one that will be the judge. We don't need to spend a lot of time ourselves trying to stand in judgment. So the first thing uh, that he that James names here is I don't have a better word for it. Let's just call it hoarding. Hoarding. They have the hoarding disorder. They have a they have they have a they have difficulty in getting rid of anything, especially money. They will not share it with the poor, even though it seems as though James is talking to people. Remember, you got the very rich and you have the very poor in James day. The very rich in most cases got more than they can use themselves, but they will not share it 
with the poor. Matter of fact, they're still doing things in order to continue to build up their riches. And they have no program whatsoever to help out those that are poor. So James call it hoarding. They are taking and heaping up on themselves in verse 1 and 3. Did you see that? And it shows that the rich had stacked it up. They had stacked up their wealth only to have it fade away. James is saying you're stacking it up, you're hoarding it, you're not helping anybody that is less fortunate than you are, but it's going to work against you in the last days when the Lord comes back. This, uh, all of this, these riches that you're storing up for yourself will be a witness against you. Are y'all with me? Listen to what he says here. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. That means, my brothers and sisters, they've run out of places to put it. Moss is getting it. They have so much, the moth is eating up their clothes. Their gold, their silver is being corroded. Are y'all with me? Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. It's going to come against them in the last days. You have heaped up treasure, what? In the last days. My brothers and sisters today, we are living in the last days. We talked a little bit about this the last time. How much is enough? If you ask those that are rich how much is enough, they'll always say just a little bit more. So their gold, James said, their silver and their garments would only rust and be eaten away. Their very riches by fading away witness against the selfish rich today and would witness against them again at the judgment time. Listen, James is saying all of this you have hoarded, all of this you have piled up is a witness against you today and it'll be a witness against you at judgment. What is, he, what is James saying? God does not forget. God is keeping record. God know what you have. God know what you're doing with what you have. Are y'all with me? Now, what is the problem here? Is it wrong for people to have money? Is it wrong for people to be rich? No, but what is your motive for having money? What is your motive for being rich? Are you willing to see the need and help somebody else that is in that is in? Need Are y'all with me tonight? So what did James say? James basically tell us here that they heaped up treasures, but they forgot that it was the last day and the judgment was coming. My brothers and sisters, these rich people were not living their lives in light of the Lord's return. In other words, they have rejected Christ. They have rejected the church. They have rejected anything that has to do with the Lord. Their main focus is making more and more and piling it up and hoarding it. Come on, somebody. They don't care about the rust corroding it. They don't care about uh, the, the moth eating up their uh, clothes. All they care about is getting more. And remember, there's really only two class of people at this time, probably. The very rich and the very poor. There is no middle class, no in-between. You'll see that over and over in the Bible. James probably refers to the fall, some, well, let me just say, some uh, scholars think that James was referring to the fall of Jerusalem and invasion of Rome in AD 70. Well, he doesn't say that. He may be just talking about the second coming of Christ. Don't forget that the apostles was looking for the Lord's return and James is looking for the Lord's return. 
The second, so the first sin was just hoarding all they could get. It's, and I looked it up, and they tell me that there is a hoarding, people have a hoarding disorder. It is a persistent difficulty discarding or parting with possessions because of a perceived need to save them. It doesn't matter how much you have. They just can't depart from anything. You know, some people have a rule. If I buy another piece, I got to give one away, you know. But there are people that has this disorder. They can't depart with anything. They have to keep everything. A person with a hoarding disorder experiences distress at the thought of getting rid of items, regardless of actual value that occurs with it. May have had it so long, it's not at the same value right now, but somebody else may need it, but they can't stand to do what? To depart with it. That is called hoarding, my brothers and sisters. So, now, that was the first thing. They never have enough. They're continuing to stack it up. Well, there's a second thing here in verse 4. The second sin that James names is stealing wages. Stealing wages. Now, think about this now. Basically, James is talking about the rich and the poor. So the rich have the poor working for them, but they are stealing wages. So who are they stealing wages from? They're stealing wages from the poor. So you see that they do have a hoarding disorder. You already have, according to James, most of them already have more than they can ever use, but yet they are stealing from not somebody that has more than they need, but they are stealing from the poor. Watch this in verse 4. Watch this. Because let's just finish verse 3 there. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. We're living in the last days right now. Look at verse 4. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept, back by fraud the people that was working their fields and James said mold your fields which you kept back fraud cry out these people are crying out because you kept their money back for yourself you didn't pay them you either the people the rich either did not pay them anything or they beat them out of it or give them part of it. He said they are crying out. And the cries of the reapers. The people that have done this work for you. Reach the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. The Lord. What do you mean by the Lord of Sabbath? That word Sabbath. Mean the Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts. God in the Bible is always known. As the Lord of and the host of the armies. God is listening. God hears. God sees what's going on. God sees the rich cheating the poor out of their little money. They get out there and work hard for them, trying to make a living, trying to get something to eat. And it's not there. They cheat them out of it. They are stealing from the poor. Watch this. For these rich had held back the honest wages of the poor. They used fraud to steal these wages and their sins would find them out. The Bible teaches us that your sins will find you out. James is telling them that, listen, God is keeping a record. We need not think that we can do these things, that we can be unjust with people, we can steal from people, and God not know about it. God is watching us. He's watching the unsaved, and he's watching those of us that are saved. But now listen, James 
is talking to the church. <laughs> so believe it or not, there's some rich folk in this church doing this. Because James is talking about lit to the church living in light of God's return. All right? So we often hear a phrase, money talks. You ever heard that phrase before? Money talks. Well, in this case, the stolen wages, James says, cry out to God for justice. The stolen wages cries out to God for justice. My brothers and sisters, and the needy workers cried out to God. This is what happened. Lord of Sabbath, Lord of the armies, and is the battle name of God. The Lord of the armies, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of the armies. He is Lord of what? He's the Lord of the battle. This is the battle name for God. God battles, goes into battle for his people. And we see it over and over in the Old Testament where God fought the battle for his people. And James is saying to the rich here in the church, listen, you may think you're getting over on these poor people, but God sees it and God will come to their rescue. If not today, then in the last day when the Lord returns, you'll have to give an account for it. My brothers and sisters, we do not get away with anything as far as God is concerned. In Isaiah 1 and 9, Romans 9 and 29, God would, it teaches us that God will come with his armies and judge these thieves. My brothers and sisters, we need to look at this tonight. We need to know that God is real. There's something I want to share with you. Just let's see what the Lord says uh, in other places about this. Let's turn to 1 Timothy. Let's see where I want, yeah. That's 2 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 6, look at verse 10. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. You see, not money itself. We need money. All of us need money. The ministry need money. Preachers need money. Deacons need money. Every, all of us need money. But listen, the love of money is what messes us up. The root. The, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. For when we love money and above people, that's the root cause of all kinds of evil. For which, listen to what Paul said, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many arrows. Our greed for money will mess us up. These people was determined to make money whatever the cost. Now listen to what Paul says in 1 Timothy 6, verse 17. Listen to what Paul says as he writes to Timothy and teaching young Timothy how to take care of the church and how to teach these people in the church. This is for church folk. Watch this. Command those who are rich. James had them in the church that are rich. Paul had some in uh, Timothy had some in his church that was what? Was rich. And listen to what Paul says to him. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be what? Haughty. Not to be haughty. Nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God. Listen, my brothers and sisters. We cannot afford to put anything above God. Let's stop putting anything, believers, before God. Money can't buy you your way into heaven. You're going to have to trust the Lord. Come on, somebody. We got to understand that. Don't trust in your riches. Trust in the almighty God. Now, trust in riches, 
Paul says riches are uncertain. You might have it today, but not tomorrow. But in the living God who gives us richly, what? All things to enjoy. God doesn't mind us enjoying the good things of life. But our motives must be pure. Our minds and our hearts must be pure. We must have the right motive, my brothers and sisters, and glorify God with the things that God bless us with. We need to glorify him and bless him with his blessings. Come on, somebody. We need to serve God and not the blessing. Serve God and not the money. Look at verse 18. First Timothy 6 and 18. Let them do good. This is what God calls us to do. You can be rich and do good. Keep things in what? In perspective. Thank God for the rich folk. Let them do good that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to do what? Willing to share. Verse 19, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold of what? Eternal life. Are y'all still with me, my brothers and sisters? So, my brothers and sisters, let's listen to what James say. We need to understand that the Lord knows everything. The Lord sees everything. The Lord knows what our worth is. He knows what we have. But he's the one that blessed us with it. See, the problem is because we get something, we forget who the blesser is. And instead of us worshiping the blesser, and asking for guidance from the blessing and how to use and how to be good stewards of what God has blessed us with, then we get lifted up in pride and we begin to act like these people that was acting in this church. We want to build it up a little more and a little more at any cost. Are y'all with me? Well, the third sin. Named is extravagant living. Extravagant living. First of all, they was hoarding. The second thing they were doing was stealing wages. But uh, in verse 4, not the, uh, and then the third thing is extravagant living in verse 5. The third thing is extravagant living. Anybody love their extravagant living? Oh, you can get used to it, I would imagine. Look at verse 5. Listen to what James said. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. Oh, man, they got it going on. Remember, the very rich are stealing from the very, they're, first of all, they're hoarding everything they can make, and yet they got plenty, but they're stealing wages from the poor. And now, James talks about their extravagant living. Their extravagant living. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. Are y'all with me? It's in verse 5 there. Indulgence. They indulge in everything that they want to. they being nourished with every good thing, extravagant living. Now certainly, look, listen, pleasure and luxury, you have fattened your hearts as in a day of slaughter. Think about that now. You have fattened your hearts as in a day of slaughter. Now, the, some of the best manuscripts, I'm told, leave out the words as in a day of slaughter. And simply has, you have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You know what it's talking about? When you, when I was, <laughs> I know exactly what they're talking about. Because even the calves, the beefs, let's say the beef, y'all may, y'all know what I'm talking about then. That my dad was going to ki have, have killed for meat, for our food. 
you would put them up in a separate place and fatten them. Fatten them. Feed, they get the best feed. But do, they did not know why we was giving them the best feed. This is what James is talking about. The cattle that they were going to use for food, you put them up in a special place, you feed them all the best food, you try to fatten them up in a hurry. Why? Because you're going to slaughter them for food. And James says these rich people are doing the same thing. They're fattening themselves up with a lot of money and riches and they're living in luxury and they don't realize they're fattening themselves up for the slaughter. That's what it'll be with. What do you mean? God is going to punish their sin. God punishes sin. Don't forget God punishes sin. Don't forget God hates sin. God hates sin even in the believers. And God will punish the believer. Those whom he loves, he chasten us. He chastised those that he loved. Who is, who is he talking about? Church, the believers, the Christians. God will chastise you. God will discipline us. And so he says, really, you are setting yourself up for the slaughter. Just like that fetid calf that you put up and you feed it good. And you, the calf don't know that in a few days... They're going to the slaughter. And God, so James is saying, this is what you do. You don't know that God is going to punish you for your sin. All right? This stuff is going to come up before you at the last day. The Lord will judge our sins. Every man, every believer will have to stand before the Lord and give an account. For the deeds of our bodies. What do you mean? What we have done with our bodies, with the blessings that God has given us, with our finances, everything, with our gifts, everything that God has blessed us with, we'll stand before him and give an account for it. What did you do with it since you've been saved? And so this is what James is saying. Certainly God wants us to enjoy the blessings of life, my brothers and sisters. But he does not want us to be wasteful and luxurious while robbing others that's in need. God will not bless that. And God will hold us responsible for that. This is why. So many times, I tell people, I'd rather give you a dime than to take a dime from you. I'd rather just have to give you a dime, give you a dollar than to take one from you. Because God is watching me. And that's what I was talking about when I started off and said, there are times when you may have to give up your right, but not your responsibility. Yeah, it's right. But... What about my responsibility to let my light shine before men that they may see my good work and glorify the Father which is in heaven? Sometimes it may come down to me giving up that right that I might keep my responsibility to God. <laughs> That's hard to understand. You get it one of these days. These men, these men was, was living in wasteful luxury and spending wantonly, using money that was not rightfully theirs to spend. Why? Because it really belonged to those people that was working for them, that was mowing their fields, getting in their hay, doing all of these things for them, and they were just saying, thank you, you did a good job, we'll see y'all tomorrow. They wasn't paying them. And if they were paying them, it was not a just wage. This is what James is dealing with, my brothers and sisters. All right? James compares them to a senseless cattle who are feeding themselves without restraint. 
little realizing that they are only being fattened up for the slaughter. Amen. The final sin is injustice. It's in verse 6. But before we go with it, we used to do hogs that way too. That's the way they do. They have to feed them specially. You put them up, you feed them special. They put them on a special diet, and man, they just eat themselves to death. They don't know the faster they get fat enough, the faster they go to the slaughter. And James is saying this is the way it is with these rich people. They don't realize that they're fattening themselves up for the slaughter. They're getting all this laid up. But guess what? They'll have to give an account to God. Are y'all with me? Look at verse 6. Because the, 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 third, the fourth sin here is injustice. Injustice. Something people cry about all the time. Let's look at it. You have condemned. You have murdered the just. He does not resist you. Now, these people, can you understand it now? These people was getting rich, whatever the cost was. They, their complete focus was on their wealth and how much more wealth they could get. And James is saying that they, they're even willing to murder folk. They're even willing to put some folk to death in order to keep building up their stash. The rich took advantage of their power to abuse and kill the poor if necessary. Are y'all with me? We go back to the Old Testament and we see this going on. Old Laban, y'all remember that? His wife told him, I know how to get that ground from that man. That's, you know, if you want it, we can get it. So you set up a trick and you get it. These Christians did not resist. The Christian wasn't resisting them, but yet they was mistreating them. But the Christian was doing what? They were being patient. They was waiting upon the Lord to fight their battles. The Lord of hosts, the Lord of the armies will fight our battles. But my brothers and sisters, this is why I said you may have to give up your right, but not your responsibility. These people, these Christians, were gave up their right because they didn't resist this. They didn't fight back. They didn't say, we'll wait till they go to sleep at night, and we'll get together, and we'll go over there to the house, and we'll just take everything we need. They didn't do that. They didn't resist them, yet some of them lost their lives. Is anybody still with me tonight? They left their case. So if they didn't resist, and James said they did not resist, what did they do? They left their case in the hand of the, relig of the righteous judge. Who is the righteous judge? The Lord himself. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. And if I said all the time, if we're going to pay people back for what they do against us and to us, then God don't owe them any punishment. If we take care of it, God don't owe them nothing. God said, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. And as believers, we have to allow God to take care of it. We got to get there, my brothers and sisters. Let me just turn over to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Let me show you. Romans chapter 12. Let me see if I can find it here. Romans chapter 12, verse 17. Watch this. Listen to what the apostle Paul says. In his letter to the Romans, repay no one evil for evil. And today, this is what we want to play. We want to play evil for evil. You mess me up, I mess you up. You mess over me, I mess over you. This is not the Christian way. This is not the way of the Lord. 
The Lord tells us to hold your peace. And I fight for you. If you're not holding your peace, God can't, is not going to fight for you. We have to show the world that we are different. That we handle things different. We need to show people that we are different from the world. We need to live our lives in a way that people will love to be around us even though they don't like what you stand for. But they want to be a, love being around you because you're different from what they're used to. Somebody biting their heads off every time they make a mistake. Y'all, anybody still with me? Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. Have regard for good things in the sight of what? All men. Look at verse 18, Romans 12 and 18. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. What if we could live peacefully with all men? What are you saying? Do your best to live peaceably even with those that are different from you. Those that have a different opinion than you. We got to get along with folks that have a different opinion than we have. We do not need to run them down because they don't think like we think. Remember, God loves all of us. He died for all of us. And if we are really different, just maybe... Just maybe God will use something in your life to touch their life. Sow the seed of righteousness. Sow the seed of the spirit. Not the seed of unrighteousness and the seed of the flesh. Look at verse 19. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves. And we don't need to spend time trying to avenge ourselves. Somebody said, Pastor, you don't understand. It just hurts. So, but yes, it hurt. But that's only feelings. We can get over it. You remember the song? Take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. If you're going to get rid of all your burdens your way, what are you going to take to the Lord? When do you go to the altar? Why do you think God give us an altar? Why do you think God said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. God said, you got a heavy load. You're weighted down with the sins of the world. You're weighted down with folk lying on you, talking about you, mistreating you. Come on, somebody. But bring it to me. Somebody said, no, nah, I'm going to take care of myself. Don't do that. Try the Lord. Try his way. Let the Lord take care of it. He can do a better job than we can do. I promise you he can. God changes folk from the inside out. We can only change them from the outside. Because all you're going to do what? Try to give them up. Black eye? You just change the outside. Things on the inside is probably get worse. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, watch it, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his own head. I can't do that, Pastor. Now you can't, but the Lord can. Jesus suffered and bled on the cross for your sins and mine. Didn't say a mumbling word in his own defense. Didn't retaliate. Didn't call nobody out of his, their name when they put nails in his hand. Didn't call nobody out of his name. Didn't curse not one time. And now you and I are saying we can't take it. No, we can't. But the Lord has already taken it. So that we can be delivered. You got help, I tell you. His name is Jesus, the Savior of the world, your rescuer. God wants to come to your rescue, and we won't allow him. 
The rich took advantage of their power to abuse and kill the poor. We don't need to be like that. The Christian did not resist. They left that case in the hands of the righteous judge, the Lord himself. Well, running out of time. The second thing, the second thing that we look at it in verses 7 through 11, and we'll finish it up next week, but the patience of the poor. Oh, it's something to be patient when you're poor. Oh, hallelujah. But you know what? We got a lot of songs that was composed by people that was poor. These old Negro spirituals, I got shoes, you got shoes. All of God's children got shoes. Do you not know that those songs were composed when people didn't, when these folk that composed them didn't have any shoes, but they were looking forward to going to heaven where everybody would have shoes? Come on, somebody. All of God's children got shoes. When I get to heaven, I'm going to put on my shoes and I'll shout all over God's heaven. Some things we may have to wait on until we get to heaven. Some of our four parents, yes, they died without shoes. But guess what? When they got to heaven, I'm sure God's got shoes for them. Come on, somebody. God is able Sometimes we just got to wait on God. No wonder Isaiah said, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, man up with wings as eagles, run and not be weary, walk and not faint. Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away and be at rest. One of these days, God's going to call me from labor to reward. He's going to call me to lay down my cross and pick up my crown and lay it at the feet of Jesus because the Lord is coming back, I tell you. <clears throat> Gracious Father, we thank you for this time that we've been able to spend in your name tonight. We thank you for what you've done, what you're doing, and what you're going to do. Lord, I'm so grateful that my life is in your hand. I'm so grateful, Lord, that you're in control. You're still on the throne. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what the news media say. I don't care what the experts say. I don't care what the medical field say. I know that you are in charge and you have it covered. And one of these days, you're coming back for your church. The church without a spot and without a blemish that's been washed in your blood. Lord, able me to be faithful. Lord, I don't care about being rich. Just let me be faithful. Because you said if we'd be faithful unto death, you'd give us a crown of life. Lord, I want a crown, not so much for myself, but to lay it at the feet of Jesus. I want to put it at your feet. Jesus said, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for keeping me. Thank you for delivering me. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.